Hey, good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you guys are in the world. Always good to connect with you and let us know where you're from. I see Ruggiero. Where are you from, Ruggiero? Let us know because we love to know where in the world you guys are tuning in from. This is going to be a super fun episode. I'll tell you about it in a second, but uh, make sure we're going to be talking about lighting, not just talking about it, but actually demonstrating it. So make sure if you do have questions about lighting, you're putting them in the uh, chat there so that we can take them up because we're going to try to take up any and all questions as we go through this. All right, well, let's do this. Let's just get this party started here. So today's episode, as you probably know, is brought to you by Bay Photo. Our friends at Bay Photo are sponsoring this show. I love these guys. I've been using them for years. They will make anything you have into one form of a print or another. It could be a book. It could be framed on your wall. It could be a card. But you know how much I tell you, you've heard this from all our guests, you got to make physical prints of your work. Take it off your computer, put it onto the wall, put it into a book, share it with somebody, and they'll give you a 25% discount for your first order. So definitely take advantage of that. Okay, you guys, so now we are bringing back Joshua Schultz. He's been with us before. He started his career as a photographer. He was taking photos of musicians, actors, models, anyone that he could find to work with. And he's photographed for such publications as the Rolling Stone magazine, Al Bellis magazine, Billboard, etc. Those are pretty impressive titles, you would agree. He's also moved into filmmaking and he loves telling stories and Josh it's so great to have you back with us. So awesome to be back. Yeah. I'm excited. And this is going to be cool what we're going to do here. You guys can see right behind him. He's got a whole setup. This isn't just going to be discussing lighting. Where he's going to show us. By the way, if I haven't already told you guys out there, make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any other shows. And Josh, I guess I'm just going to open it up to you. Let's... Talk about lighting and how you approach lighting and, you know, how you work with your subject and your model. Okay, great. So today uh, we're going to do three very simple lighting setups. Um, one thing I wanted to do is show that lighting could be very simple. It doesn't have to be this massively complicated thing. Yeah. And with just one light, you can uh, do quite a lot. And um, so the first lighting we're going to do is I'm going to do a portrait session and we're using this pro photo light. It's called a strobe and a beauty dish also from pro photo. And we're going to be shooting on our digital camera, the 5D SR uh -huh. and I'm gonna start with the 85 millimeter lens, which is my favorite for portrait. Right. What model also, pro photo is that by the way, Josh? Uh, I think it's the, let's see, it's the D1. D1, okay. We'll put that in the in the description as well so you guys can track with what he's doing. We're also going to be shooting uh, on film. Nice. This 1060s Hasselblad. I love it. And so you can see the same in the digital world and also how I shoot on the film. And uh, then we'll go into more of a full body light and then a natural light. Awesome. Wow. That is super cool. And uh, so today we have um, our model, Anne. Anne, would you step in? Hello, Anne, and thank you for joining us on Advancing Your Photography. All right. So first, I'm going to turn on the digital camera. As best as I can, I'm going to try to show the photos to you here. Cool. Um, on the top here, I have a remote. It's called a Hachu. And this is uh, also made from Profoto. So when I take a photo, it syncs to my strobe. So we'll do a little test. Boom, that worked. Great, so um, I haven't actually totally set up the lighting for her, so you get to watch me do that. But uh, anyway, let's start. 
And we will <laughs> chime in with any questions as you're doing it. Uh, we've got the Blind Husky team has joined us from Poland. Welcome to the whole team. And Paul says he likes your hat. Both of you guys have cool hats. It's a hat day here. Yeah. I love it. And what are you doing exactly? So right now I'm, I'm adjusting the power of my strobe, how much light's coming out. So the okay. first photo was um, a little overexposed. Yeah. Uh, so I'm having her step back a little bit because, you know, obviously how close she is to light and how far away will affect how much light is bouncing off of her skin. Right. So she went back a little bit. I brought the power of the strobe down a little bit. Um, and I brought my aperture up a little bit because I, I have a certain... Uh, level of aperture I like I don't my personal taste I don't like my aperture to be too shallow I know a lot of people like it shallow but I like it the opposite it's just personal preference what are you saying uh, at right now so right now my shutter is 1 25th and my aperture is 6.3 okay and okay. then I also like a little warmer on the light so my Kelvin's 6000 uh-huh um, uh -huh. and my ISO is 100 cool so Let's see how the lighting is. So just a commentary. So if you guys don't know what Kelvin is, you should learn about it. But it's basically a scale of the warmth of your lighting or coldness. Daylight ranges around 5,500. So he's a little bit warmer than normal daylight. And if it goes lower, you're going to get a more bluish light. But it's good to know about Kelvin. We'll probably put it. I might even put a little description in the link so that we can make sure everybody's up to speed on that. All right, so I'm pretty happy with this lighting. Let me see if I can get that close. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, good. Now, one thing I like to do is on the digital camera, you can click your little info button, and you can get what's oh, yes. called the hist your histogram. Yeah, because I did have a question there. It, it, she's very well lit on that one side, but that's not blown out. You can see from the histogram. Right. Yeah. So the the screens on the digital camera aren't always the best reference. Right. So like if I'm out in the desert and I'm shooting and the sun is so bright I could barely see the screen, then I'm just relying on my eye in here and the histogram information to make sure that it's not too bright and it's not too dark. Exactly. And I have enough my photo so when I go home that I can uh, you know, do what I need to do in Photoshop. A histogram is a, an amazing tool in a digital camera. There's no question about that and we all have to use it. What's amazing too about the histogram is even though the name is kind of scary, like it's going to be this big scientific thing, I watched one YouTube video 10 minutes and I knew so much about it. And ever since then, my entire photography career changed. Yeah. So it could be very simple. And again, a lot of things in photography, a lot of the basics, um, you can obviously get into lots of. Uh, of the technology behind it and the science and get easily overwhelmed. But if you start out with just the basics and as soon as you learn something that's basic, my advice is to then go and apply it immediately so that you get the information and then you see it in the physical universe. Yeah. For me, I retain the information uh, and then I can create art. But if you know, you sit there and you just read words for months and you never do anything with it, for me personally, I don't necessarily retain it. So I, I advise anyone that I'm teaching to learn a couple basics and then go use those until you fully get it and then go to the next step. That is such good advice. I put that in my book, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact. Oh, great. We have one question already. Well, you might as well take it up from Stephen. Do you not like to tether or what's your preference on that? I actually, uh, I have a tether cord for my 1DX, but my 1DX is currently in the shop being fixed. Uh -huh. so 
I'm trying out the 5 DSR, and I just don't have the cord for it. Okay. But you prefer tethering if you can? Um, I really prefer not tethering. Okay. But if I have people in the room um, that want to see what I'm doing, then I tether. Otherwise, for me, it depends on what you're doing. Like if I'm shooting art and it's between me and the, the subject, I don't like too many distractions right. or too many things pulling me away from having all my focus on what I'm doing. Uh, but if I have like, say I'm shooting a band for a magazine and their labels there and they want to see what I'm shooting, then yeah, I would tell yeah. yeah, good point. Um, so, all right, so let's do a few more uh, portraits. We also another question. This okay. is shared, by the way, for the audience. Um, another question was, what's the benefit of a fixed light over a camera flash? I figured since we're talking about lighting and stuff, that might be a good time to address it. Okay, so a camera flash, uh, if you have the on-camera flash, there's a certain amount of power that comes out of it. It's also attached to your camera. So um, it can be beneficial uh, if that's the look you want. But having a strobe is, you know, you have a lot more power in terms of energy. And there's a, a million more things you could do with it. So it just depends on what kind of look you're going for. So say if, I'm, uh, if I want that on flash look and I want the light to hit like this and I want only a certain amount of power, the flash is great. In fact, a lot of times when I shoot bands, I prefer just shooting with a flash um, because it gives me a certain style and look. But when I get more, uh, you know, detailed on on my art and I want more control, then I'll go to a strobe um, or natural light. Yeah, just different tools for different looks. Exactly. Right. Yeah, great. Um, okay, cool. We're gonna do a couple more portrait shots. And then we'll change up the lighting. Okay. Any more questions? Just chat it out. Yeah. So what, one thing I'm doing is I'm positioning her and I'm being uh, paying attention to the light and where the light is shooting and where her face is. And for starters, I'm hitting her with a side light. And that gives me a certain look. Yeah. And then sometimes even with a beauty dish, I like to go directly in front of them, kind of like this. So the light is shaping from the face and that tends to make them a little bit more flat, but sometimes that's the look I want. Let's see what you got. Yeah, that really does change the shaping, doesn't it? The modeling. Yeah, and then another interesting thing is uh, in horror films, they like to, to light from below because it can make uh, someone look a little bit scary. Or oh, yeah. Easy. Um, a lot of times when I'm shooting uh, for beauty, I like to come up a little bit at an ankle so that the light uh, sort of shapes them from above and it tends to look more pleasant. So we'll yeah. try that now. Actually, why don't you lose the hat? Yeah. Okay. Oh, there goes the hat. <laughs> All right, so. And you know, one thing, when you're moving the light around, you can basically emulate what the sun would do. Oh, that's nice. I like that. Very warm. Also, you could tell in her eyes with the light above too, you get a little reflection in the eyes and oh, it helps make it. That's light. That's yeah, right. a little catch light. So again, it depends on um, what look or mood you're going for. And my favorite thing about photography is once you understand uh, you know, where the light is set up in your settings, you can sort of control the emotion or the mood connected to the photo. Right. And so this gives me a certain feeling when I look at it of beauty. And Josh, do you tend to just 
uh, experiment and, and try different things so that you've recorded that, uh, you know, various different shoots, uh, shots you've taken. And then you when you get into the studio, you have a variety of things to choose from. Yeah, what I like to do is um, I test all the time. So with my camera and my lenses and my lights, I just play around. Yeah. And it's one thing if, if you watch videos and people tell you, uh, what things do, but I think once you get basic understanding, you should just practice the different light with lenses, move around, and you'll start sort of feeling uh, what you like um, and developing your own style. But then you'll also understand how to manipulate the looks to get what you want. Makes sense. And that's one of the nice and, things uh, about digital. There's no limit to <laughs> your number of number of images you record is pretty limitless. Yeah, in fact, now I'm going to take a photo on film really quick. Okay. Uh, so here we have uh, the Hasselblad, and I loaded it with uh, Kodak Portra 400, meaning the film, in sense of a digital camera, your ISO is already at 400, so that's the sensitivity of the film. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, with a digital camera, I can look at the back and check the lighting. But for film, you got to use a light meter. Right. And so what we're going to do is um, we're going to use this light meter and find out. I already have the setting here, ISO 400 for the film. Find out what our settings are. Okay. Okay. I'm so going to just that, chime in one thing, Josh. I recommended yeah. in my book, Advancing Your Photography, that people should get light meters. Even if they're shooting digital, it helps to train your eye and just walk around with it because you're going to become more sensitive to what different light readings are. It really does help. Oh, my God, yeah. I mean, even if I'm shooting, like, especially if I'm, I was in Joshua Tree last week shooting 100 degrees, bright sun, yeah. I can barely see my screen, so I'll take a light reading, and I know that the information from the light meter is 100% accurate. So I don't have to guess with the digital, I can just concentrate on composition, type in my stuff from my light meter, take my photos, and I'm good to go. Exactly. So I don't get home exactly. and realize, you know, I messed up on uh, too much uh, highlights or whatever. Yeah. But the light meter is, uh, I think, more important than I ever knew. Um, and it's a game changer. Absolutely. And they're not that expensive. You can get, you can find deals on light meters. Somebody asked what's a good expensive light meter. We'll probably, I'll put a link in, but you know, you don't have to spend a lot of money for a good light meter these days. Yeah. You can get nice cheap ones. Unfortunately, I didn't, yeah. <laughs> I, I recommend the Sekonic. Yeah, that's a good one. But it was like eight hundred dollars. Yeah. Um, but there are. Uh, it depends on what you're using it for. I mean, when before I got this, I was using my iPhone app uh, light meter, and uh, that's like forty percent accurate. But, yeah. Um, I'm not sure I trust those. Yeah, I would. But anyway, so the light meter says, with my ISO being four hundred or my sensitive film for my portrait four hundred, to have my aperture at eight and my shutter 125. So yeah. I set that on here. And you've got your slide. I'm just going to say he still has the slide in there, folks. You're going to see. <laughs> so right now, if he tried to take a photograph, it wouldn't even, the shutter wouldn't work. Yeah. It will well, lock let me it. Take, but if I do this. Now. So explain to him what's going on there, because uh, not everybody knows about these backs that are on your Hasi. There's film in this back here. Let me put the slide back in. Um, you can have multiple backs of different types of film. Yeah, isn't that cool? Color, black and white, and also you can have a digital back as well, which is a new thing. And you load it here, and the slide is so that your film doesn't get exposed to light because obviously film is light sensitive. Yeah. And so yeah. this protects that so you don't 
get light leaks. I love it. And it's a magical it thing. Out, it really is. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, built in 1960, and it's still, to me, one of the best film cameras in the world, one of the best cameras in the world. Yes. Um, all right, so I have my settings in. I'm now going to look through this. I wonder if you can actually, there's a mirror in here. Yeah, yeah. We, we can see. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to look through that, compose my shot, and I have it synced to the same remote, and it'll take a photo uh, of, of her to the film. I just need to grab one cord. Thanks again, Ann. It's very nice of you to join us. Okay, cool. Here we go. Did you hear that? We did. I'm going to do one just, I'm going to ruin one shot. Oh, yeah, so there you go. go. 12 shots. You've got one there. You're on two. Yep. There we go. Boom. Uh -huh. And, you know, Josh, the thing about shooting film, I talk in my book about visualization a lot. And uh -huh. visualization becomes even more important when you're shooting film because you can't look at the back. I mean, it's important for any kind of photography or videography or filmmaking or any artistic endeavor for that matter. But for film, it's essential that you learn how to visualize what the camera is actually going to see. Oh, yeah. And also, one of the biggest lessons I learned from film that made my digital photography much better is that with film, it forces you to slow down. Yeah. And then. Instead of um, taking a picture, you're making a picture. Yes. You're in charge of the creation of the image because in film, you, you got to look at everything and, you know, it's not cheap. So if I'm spending all this money to buy and develop the film, I want that shot to be as great as possible. So then when I go back to the digital, when I slow down and I take my time and I make a picture, it's a million times better because, you know, you could shoot and get lucky with digital, but if you just slow down and you trust your artistic instincts, um, you'd be surprised how much better of an artist you become. I love it. Here, here. Um, so now I'm gonna switch the lighting up a little bit uh, and do a few more in the digital. Okay. So, okay. And let me have you back. Uh, we're gonna take the beauty dish off. Yeah, I'm with you on that point about slowing down because you know it's it's like just pressing the shutter doesn't mean you have made a photograph it's t that's the difference between taking a photograph which is kind of a snapshot and making one as Ansel Adams said he said you don't take a photograph you make it it's it's fully under your control and our friend Bob Holmes talks about you got to learn to see what the camera sees and you're responsible for everything in the frame it's your it's your creation. You're responsible for it. And that to me is, uh, you know, an artist. An artist makes something. Yeah. And creates something. So with this lighting setup, I'm gonna I'm gonna change my style. I'm placing the light in the model and a little bit up at it, and I'm gonna blast her with light, uh, eliminating a lot of any shadow. And it's going to give it uh, a little bit more of a poppy look. Um, I'll show you what I mean. Yeah. Change lenses. So I'm switching from my 85 millimeter to my 50. So I can get a little bit more of her in the shot. All right. Let's see what you got there. 
I'm going to zoom in a little bit so we can get more detail. Yeah, it, yeah, the light is definitely more uniform across her face. And obviously the 50 gives us a much wider look. Yeah, and I, I personally like this style. Uh, I think it's a really cool look. A lot of times I use it when I'm shooting for like a clothing brand or for a band. Um, you know, again, it just depends on the mood that you're going for. That's a, a zoomed out shot. Oh, yeah, look at the difference. So, yeah, I can see where if you're shooting clothing, you would want that pulled back look. Yeah, because then you get a nice, even uh, exposure of all the clothes. Um, and, you know, my aperture is at 20. Uh, oh. So I'm blasting with a lot of light. And uh, so everything's in focus, which is, you know, something that I like. So we'll do a couple shots of that, and then we'll switch over to natural light. Okay. Yeah, Stephen was asking, what are the beeps coming from in the strobe? Oh, so when I take a picture, uh, electricity needs to go back into the strobe. It's called recycling. Yeah. It's letting me know when it's ready to fire again. So I take a photo, and then electricity goes in, and then it says, okay, I'm ready. If you shoot too fast before it's recycled, not the same amount of energy will burst out in your yeah. photo exposure will be different or it won't fire at all and you'll have a you know not a probably just a dark screen yeah good uh, point yeah and uh yeah so that's that's another one light look let me show you i'm gonna do a zoom in first oh yeah and then let's zoom out Actually, let me do one landscape one so we can fill the screen that one. Yeah. <laughs> what happened? <laughs> um, so you heard me fire too early before it recycled and it made a louder beep. Uh-huh. But another important thing, too, when you're just in photography in general is uh, how you point your camera is very important. Like, you can point down like this and get a little bit of a upper shot, which I find is really great when I'm shooting girls. It gives a very pleasant beauty look. Yeah. Uh, or you can kind of come from below a little bit. You go too far below... Not very many people look good from right here. Yeah, it's not yeah. flattering. Um, but if you get the right angle, you can get this uh, feeling where the character is larger than life. It's called like the hero shot. Mm -hmm. They feel kind of important. But just make a conscious uh, effort to think about how your lens is leveled, whether it's straight on, like this and like this and then see how it looks and how it makes you feel and then you'll know in the future you know how to maneuver your camera because i've seen people that have been teaching and they just naturally move their lens like this and they can't get what they want and then when i point it out and they're thinking about it it gives them a lot more control of their photo so for her this is a, a straight on right Yes, you can sort of see it. Yeah, there we go. And I know when you point down a little bit, you it brings out the eyes. You can actually sort of make the eyes appear a little bit larger. Yeah. And another thing, I my old assistant used to make fun of me because I, I used to always scream uh, chin down. Because sometimes, um, you know, people can sort of have this yeah. tendency to do this. And I find when your chin's slightly down, you just you get great composition. 
Could you just gonna, for for I'm uh, sorry for illustration? Could you do one sh a shooting up like a hero shot and just we yeah. can see? There's a famous shot Annie Leibovitz did of Arnold Schwarzenegger, where she actually had a trench dug, so that she could get really low, and he's like towering above her. If you ever get a chance to look at it, check it out. It's a, this is a little bit below. Yeah. Yeah, see, that totally changes her look. You'll notice that in movies when the character walks in and you want the character to feel more dominant, the camera angle will be below. And then if you want the character they're talking to to feel more like, uh, you know, not as in control of the situation as the other character, the camera will be above. Right. And subconsciously, you'll just register that, that person might be in a little bit more trouble than the other person. Exactly. Uh, a lot of times when I see the bully shots at a school, you'll see the bullies walk in and the cameras. Big as life. Yeah, bigger than life. Yeah. These are really so good points, Josh. These are simple changes that you, you guys, you can always make and should. Yeah. Uh, another really great tip is if the light is hitting somebody too harsh from the side, uh, your pores and every little tiny bump on your face, especially when it comes to digital, not so much uh, film, although it could happen in film too. And so I try to be careful of where I place the light so I'm not showing every single pore and yeah. person looks uh, not so great, but have the light give me either a very soft or a harsh light, but makes their, their skin look good and you know, and then again, paying attention to how your lens is so that um, if I want them to look beautiful in the shot, I bring that out. Yeah. Good point. So I'm going to do one very dramatic below and then one from above and then we'll move on to natural light. Awesome. And thank you for joining us, Jean from France. Nice to have France represented here. Okay, so this is very dramatic from below. Yeah. And then now let's do from above. And then this is oh, there we from go. the above look. Right. And then the next look we're going to do is natural light on the same backdrop. Cool. So I'm going to fill the stroke. And we'll get these images from you, Josh, and put them in our show notes so everybody can look at them as the final uh, okay. image, which will help. I'm going to open up these big blinds here so that we get lots of natural light coming in. Lots of natural light coming in. Window also light. Also have cloudy day, so the uh, little soft extra box. soft lights. Yeah. And then yeah. I'm actually going to turn off the lights in here because they are yellow. Yeah. And the outside is more cold, so we're talking a little bit about Kelvin. So I don't want to mix up uh, blue and yellow light, so I'm going to stick with the natural light. Right. And use uh, my camera settings uh, for that. Oh, she's turning them off. Okay, so. Yeah, you can see, actually, when she did that, you could just see the room get a little bluer instantly. Yeah, because the, the, even the camera on the computer is trying to adjust. Yeah. So, about light meters, I'm actually going to use a light meter for my digital camera in the shot. Um, and what it is is this little guy right here yeah. is going to take a reading. So, so it's telling me aperture 5.6. And you took three readings there. Are you, are you kind of averaging? Yeah, so I wanted to read the side where the light's hitting her, the side that's away from the light, so the shadows. Right. In the middle. Okay. And uh, then I, in my head, 
I would average, although when I just did all those readings, they were all the same. So I'm safe on this, I think, because there's so much soft light everywhere. Yeah, it's bouncing around the room. Yeah. So let's take a, a natural light shot of her on the same background. We're not hearing any beeps anymore, you guys. Okay, so one reason I like the 50 millimeter lens is it's the closest to the human eye. It's actually one of my favorite lenses, Yeah. just yeah. as an overall. Um, so in this, this is the natural photo. I like that look. Yeah, there's just something really, I love natural light, I think. I do too. I think it's so underappreciated. Uh, in fact, my whole new series, I've been shooting just film in natural light. So, I have a question for Anne, actually, at this point. Uh -huh. So Anne, I mean, you're a professional model, but do you, do you have a preference? Because when you have a big strobe flashing right in your face, that's not always really comfortable, right? Does it feel more comfortable just with natural light? Um, I would say I like natural light more because I'm like really tan. I'm like not tan at all. So I like it more when I shoot with natural light. But to have like a light can be cool too. It depends what kind of shooting you do and like yeah. what the is about to be so yeah okay yeah, I mean, that's something important to pay attention to is how the light reflects off of you so sometimes when i've shot in in the past if the light's too harsh you know it ref it's reflecting a lot more light off her where if i shoot something that's tan it's absorbing a little bit of the light and that's another thing you have to pay attention to as a photographer is you know the subject and front of you and adjusting your camera to that person. Right. So now we're going to take a, a photo on the film one again. We already got the reading. Uh, it's at 5.6 aperture at 125. And again, the speed of our film is 400. So I'm going to take the slide out. Yep. And we're going to take uh, a photo of her face with natural light. Cool. So you were shooting ISO 400 on your Canon, sounds like. Yes. Okay. So you've got them both the same ISO. Yeah, I should have said that. I like yeah. to uh, do that sometimes just so that it makes know, it's sense. easier. Yeah. So once I get these developed too, I'll send them to you. That'd be so you awesome. You have a uh, lab in LA that you use? Yeah. Uh, it's called Icon. It's in West Hollywood. Um, probably one of the best labs around, uh, and, uh, yeah, they're great. Um, I w used to go to a few other labs, but the, it, that's another thing that's very important is I would take a photo and I would think I'd messed it up, but how the, it was developed and how the color was handled, uh, you really have to have a lab that knows what they're doing. That's so I had a true. lab that so was, yeah. Yeah. They're making everything very green, and I was doing a bad job. And then I went to a lab that knows what they're doing, and then everything started coming out perfect. So that's important. I would say look at the reviews when you go to a lab and make sure that uh, you're not wasting money, but you're going to someone that knows what they're doing, and you get the best results every time. Good point. And they send you back. Do you get contact prints and a, a digital scan? What I personally like to do is I will get uh, the scan of the whole roll yeah. uh, just transferred to me. And then if there's one negative, like, for example, I'm working on my first art show. So I've been shooting all this film. Say I develop a roll for 25 bucks, and there's a frame in there that I'm like, that's the photo I'm going to use in my art show. I take that negative back, and I get what's called a, a drum scan. 
uh, right. which is like a hundred dollars. So, but the quality is insanity. Your photo, if it's really good on the basic scan, hyper drum scan, it's like a masterpiece. I know. <laughs> it's cool. um, and they're big but files. The subject uh, of how to work with film, but uh, but anyway, yeah. So lighting wise, um, that was obviously fast and simple, but. Sometimes I spend hours just playing around with the one light moving it around sideways, above, below, straight on. Um, and you get, you can have one subject with one outfit and get, you know, five different emotions from that. And it's super fun. Um, and if you have a digital camera, a light, it could be a strobe, meaning it fires and then goes off, or it could be a constant light, meaning it's just on the whole time. With a constant light, you don't need a remote because it's just yeah. on the whole time. Like and a, with a stroke, effect. Yeah, you need a, yeah. a remote. Yeah. Good. Any other questions? Oh, that was awesome. Let's see if we haven't. Jerry, do we have any other questions that we haven't taken yeah. up? Um, here, this should be a quick one. Um, when you print, uh, uh, somebody wanted to know, is it sRGB or Adobe uh, RGB? When you print, I'm not I, I'm not as familiar with printing and, two and different, colors and um, stuff. Also, that how you print um, is a little bit more complicated because it it has to do with what your purpose of the print is. For mm -hmm. an example, like Mark was going to say, you can print those different color schemes when you're doing basic printing, but if you're going to do an art show, there's uh, many other tiers of quality and um, if you wanted to do like a really professional art show I would go to a lab and have them show you all the prints yeah. and talk yeah. about what the purpose is um, but yeah but with the other printing I don't know I guess it depends more on preference yeah so yeah. it's really preference and the situation that you're in and the quality like uh, if you have a basic print it can last um, a certain number of years and then if you spend more money to get a much higher quality print at a lab it can last 500 years you know what I mean yeah just depends on the purposes when you guys get when you do artistic prints it's really great to have a lab that you can work with side by side because the skill involved in that is tremendous I don't have the bandwidth to learn and I don't want to buy the equipment that they have. But when you get a skilled technician that you can collaborate with, just like Josh is saying, they can show you the various different looks and profiles and whatnot until you dial it into exactly what you want. Well, for example, Ansel Adams was a master with developing and printing. And yeah. uh, just as much as he would take an incredible photo he would take that photo and turn it into a masterpiece. And so that's like a whole other... That's a whole other skill. That's a full documentary on that. But not to get too overwhelmed, I would say take some photos that are properly lit and print them on you know, your basic home printer and see what that looks like. Because uh, seeing something printed is a much different uh, feeling than looking at it on Instagram. Yes digital thing. So I do suggest once you get a photo that you really admire that you took, print it. Uh, whether it's just on letter paper or you go to a lab and you get it three feet by two feet. Because that's just going to, for me, it changed how I shoot and how I look at my photos. Exactly. Right. And, and then we can, have another question. You can send oh, them to Bay Photo ahead. Guys, which is, again, they're going to give you, you can get small prints or you know, test prints and then dial it in from there, which really does help you visualize what the final print is going to look like. And it's also like what uh, Dan Milner has talked about when, you know, he talks a lot about when you're wanting to do books, having test books yeah, definitely. to see what it looks like, because you're never going to know what it looks like until you see what it looks like. Exactly. Yeah. Impossible. You're not going to just order shoes you're gonna look at different styles and try them on and see what you personally like good point yeah one more uh, question. we got another good question about lights uh somebody wanted to know do you usually just use one light or more and then um 
uh, was also asking about using soft boxes versus beauty dishes. Yeah, so I tend to use between one to two lights. Uh, I don't think, very rarely do I ever go above that. But a lot of times I'm shooting one person. Um, and the beauty dish for me, I mainly use if I'm shooting someone's face, like a portrait, because the light is big, shaped, you know, it bounces off this guy, and then it goes around this, and it gives a soft beauty light on their face. So I like to use this if I'm doing portraits or something, you know, closer up. And then you saw without the modifier where it was just a strobe, sometimes I like that harsh light. Uh, and then a softbox, um, I have a couple softboxes. I have a three foot and an eight foot. Um, I tend to use those a lot if I want something that's uh, just much softer or moodier. Um, I like to use two lights if I want to shoot from the side um, to create what's called more of a layered look in my photos. And that just means that instead of like the harsh light where the subject is against the wall and it's flat layered is so that, you know, the subject pops out a little bit more right? and a little bit more three dimensional. Um, but again, that's something that like I would play around with. And, uh, my suggestion is just to start simple and then kind of get some of the basics and then go to the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And you'll realize that lighting doesn't have to be, this huge PhD, it could just be very simple and not too overwhelming. Good point. And the only way you get to do it is just by, like you said at the very beginning of the show, is just test it out for yourself. Don't have this stuff in your head. Because, Josh, you, you pointed out something really huge, and that is, you know, you can get this sort of indigestion if you just stuff a bunch of stuff into your head, either watching videos or reading and you don't ever apply it, it's just like sitting there like a lump. Because the only way you're ever going to know how it works is how it works for you. So it's really yeah. important to test these things out. Best advice is the Nike one. Just do it. Because I learned more in photography by being out in the field shooting constantly. And I remember every time I watch a documentary about a, a master photographer that I admire – the one common denominator of all of them is they took so many photos. I was watching one a week ago. I don't know if it was Avedon, but it was like yeah. negatives was over a million. Like that's, it's, that's a lot of photos, especially on film. I don't know if you know Dick Zimmerman, but he's, uh, he, um, he's now, he's kind of retired from photography. Now he's doing paintings, which are unbelievable. But he was, he's a uh, celebrity photographer. And I talked to him years ago and he said, you know, shoot 20 rolls a day. Whoa. Oh my God. 20, 20 rolls, a day. rolls a day. You know how expensive that is. And just, but you're going to figure it out. 20 rolls a day. That's yeah, I dropped uh, four rolls a couple days ago to Icon. Between that and the scan sending to me, it was 115 bucks. Yeah. Without buying the film. So, yeah, but if you, and that's the great thing about digital, I mean, you can go out, shoot hundreds of photos, uh, and then I've also seen where someone will go out and take hundreds of photos and then not look at it. I think just as important as taking the photos is putting them on your computer and examining each photo. Totally. And you start understanding you know, things you like about it, things you don't like. And if there's something you don't understand, you can learn it and then you get better each time. It, it's important to be able to self critique. It really is, you know, look at it and just be honest about it yourself. Like this photo really sucks. There's nothing I'm going to do with this to fix it. You know, I've tried processing it and changing it, but it's just not a good image. Okay. Fine, I learned something from that. You know, maybe I didn't wait long enough to get that exact gesture or you know expression that I was looking for. All right, and also, if you get into that rhythm, you will become great. And yeah. uh, photography, as far as I know, is something that you never stop learning. It you will always so true. be studying. Josh, thank you so much for joining us again. This has been fantastic. I want to do another one 
we'll do more of these because I think this is really, really important. I hope you guys agree. This kind of hands-on, absolute, you know, like we're we're there with you. We're seeing exactly what you're doing. It's really I love great. it. Be my honor. Awesome. Well, thanks again, and thank you, Anne, if you're still there for joining us. Really appreciate it. And hope to have you guys back with us again. Thanks again. All right, Josh. So, guys, this is awesome. This is kind of a new, we're just testing this out. We've only done it once before with Bob Holmes. But I really think it's a great format. And I hope you guys agree. Let's do more of these because there's so much to learn from seeing a pro at work. I, I know you agree with me on that. Um, just to let you know, on Friday, which is tomorrow, isn't it? Tomorrow is Friday. Wow. What happened to this week? And what happened to this year? We're coming up to the end of the first half of 2020. Thank goodness we're ending it because it's not been the easiest year on the books. And let's hope for a much better second half. But tomorrow, I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to talk about the more philosophical side of photography. Josh touched upon it just a moment ago when he said, you know, you never stop learning. And I believe that photography is just one aspect of life and creativity. And it's a window into a much bigger creative experience. I'm going to talk with you guys about that tomorrow and how one could be a part of a renaissance or a creative community where each member rises as the whole group rises. I know that sounds kind of amazing, but it, it actually has happened. I'm going to tell you some stories from my own experience and how we can recreate that ourselves. I don't think anybody would deny that it would be part to be part of such a group would be thrilling. And what AYP is actually all about is connecting you guys with those talented people and so you can see how they do it, what they do, and use it in your own photography. Okay, join me tomorrow at 10 a.m., okay? Promise? Tell your friends. This is going to be a very important show. I'm going to kind of open the curtain a lot more probably than I ever have and give you guys some interesting insight into my world, which I hope you enjoy. So what else is going on here, guys? Make sure you're you know, plugging into the AYP Club so we can carry on the conversation. I love seeing all your comments and questions. So awesome. Uh, Jared will put the link there. Uh, stay tuned on our events calendar because it's there we're we're actually posting everything ahead of time what we're going to be doing jared will also put that link up there as always make sure you subscribe you know the channel has grown quite a bit and thank you guys for helping us do that would you please double your efforts tell your friends tell your neighbors tell people that you don't even like about ayp because it's going to make them better photographers better neighbors better friends it's a good thing, okay? It's up to you guys to help spread the word, and you've been doing a good job, so keep doing that. Leave your comments in the actual video. Like, and I think that's everything. I've covered everything. By the way, I if you hadn't heard, I know Bev wanted to buy my hat. Bev, this hat isn't for sale, but guess what? It was designed by Carlos Santana. We're actually... <laughs> hooked up with the wholesaler we're going to start selling them pretty soon so you can have your very own mark silver ayp hat i just got to find a little bandwidth to do that but it's coming your way soon well that's about it one last thing i want to remind you guys to get out and capture your own images of life let me say that again Remember to get out. You guys say this with me, okay? Wherever you are in the world, remember to get out and capture your own images of life. Love you guys. Take care. Stay safe. Get out in the world. It's opening up. And we'll see you tomorrow at 10 a.m. Pacific time, okay?